Good evening, everybody. Glad you're joining us tonight for a great program. Uh, I want to welcome back some of you who have been attending these uh, webinars with us over the months, um, but also want to welcome newcomers who maybe have uh, learned about, want to learn about dragonflies and damselflies or picked up on a, a topic that you might not be uh, so knowledgeable about. Um, I, I want, I, my name is Peggy Simonson and I am a, a member of the board of Chicago Living Corridors who is the sponsor of these webinars and I want to give you just a little bit of background about it before we introduce our speaker. Oh, first, I'm sorry, we're first going to talk about the technical aspect of it. Go ahead, sure. Iris. Yeah, okay. Hi, Peggy. Um, and uh, hi, I'm Iris Caldwell. Uh, so I'm going to be running kind of the technical back end uh, today. So if you have any sort of technical issues, feel free to chat them into the chat box um, and I can help resolve um, any questions you have. But just a couple of reminders. Um, there's two ways to get the audio for the webinar. Um, I assume many of you are using your computer uh, speakers, but if you're having any sort of audio issues with your computer speakers, you can also alternatively uh, switch to phone call mode um, and you can dial in over your phone. So just to know that that's an option. Um, everyone is going to be muted today, uh, just given the size of our audience. Uh, but if you have, again, any questions or technical issues or, again, questions for Marla, our presenter today, um, go ahead and chat them into the chat box at any point. Um, and we have some time at the end. We will walk through those questions. Um, also, another alternative, um, you can raise your hand. There's a little button to virtually raise your hand. Um, and that's an indication to me that you either have a question or maybe a technical issue. Um, and I'll chat you um, if that's the case. So that's the, the technical back end you need to know uh, for GoToWebinar. Back to you, Peggy. Okay. All right, oops, darn it. There's a little bit of a lag on my screen. So uh, the Chicago Living Corridors is an umbrella organization in the greater Chicago area whose mission is to focus on private, privately owned property uh, to help improve the habitat. Uh, as you see on this, we, we recognize that 90 to 95% of land in Illinois is, is, is publicly, uh, is privately owned. Uh, and we of course collaborate with the forest preserves and some of the, the publicly owned properties that are working on, on building habitat. But our focus is on, to a large extent, homeowners or people who have small property. And we're wa wanting to help you folks improve the property on your own in your own property uh, to improve the habitat uh, and we're, we're uh, we have a lot of resources on our website to help inform about what kind of native plants work where or, or what uh, what uh, uh, plants or anim what animals they support what what pollinators they support uh, and we do that by uh, having individuals join uh, some of the local conservation organizations. Originally, uh, Chicago Living Corridors was founded by these uh, five groups. Uh, Citizens for Conservation is the organization that I'm with, uh, and we have a program called Habitat Corridors in the Greater Barrington area, where we uh, make site visits to help people with the uh, um, issues of getting rid of invasives or what plants to plant, what kind of conditions that, uh, to work with the conditions they have. There's also the Wildflower Propagation and Preservation Committee's mentoring program in uh, the McHenry County area. Theirs is called a natural garden in your yard. And the Conservation Foundation has the Conservation at Home program. Uh, and a number of conservation organizations around the Chicago area use conservation at home. So that is probably the most widely uh, spread one. And both the uh, Wild Ones chapters, Northern Kane and West Cook, also have programs helping individual property owners improve their habitat. So those were the, we were the founders of this group. And since then, we now have a number of other organizations that have joined us. This, these ones listed here also do uh, home visits or uh, property visits to help people identify the, the uh, uh, kind of habitat needs they have, or in some cases, some of you maybe already have wonderful habitat already developed in your yard and would like the opportunity to get credit for it. 
and so uh, Chicago Living Corridors maps these properties. And this is just a screenshot here, but if you go on the Chicago Living Corridors website, chicagolivingcorridors.org, uh, this is interactive. But what we've done is you can see the, the the green uh, dots here are the, the Barrington area, that's the uh, Habitat Corridor sites. The red are all the conservation at home sites. So those you can see spread out a lot. So the different organizations that were on that previous screen have, have uh, dots on the map. So you as an individual can't call us and say, put my dot on the map, but you can get connected with one of the organizations. And if you go on the CLC website, you can see where they're located and their contact information and so forth. Uh, we're, we're, our goal is to get as many groups who are uh, developing habitat on private property on our map as possible, and it's growing. We continue to, to, to add to it. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. We are really pleased to have Marla Garrison with us. <clears throat> she is going to speak on the life cycle of dragonflies and damselflies. She is a biology instructor at McHenry County College and is the author of Damselflies of Chicago of Chicagoland, which is published by the Field Museum. You're really going to enjoy this presentation. Uh, we've heard her before and she has an engaging style and amazing photos that you'll just be enthralled with and a wealth of knowledge about dragonflies and damselflies. So uh, as Iris said, if you have questions as we go along, put them in the chat and we'll be able to pick up some of them at the end of the program. But with that, I'm going to introduce Marla. Thank you so much, Peggy, and thank you all for attending tonight's webinar. Any chance I get ever to talk about my favorite topic, I embrace and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really excited to uh, be part of the Chicago Living Corridors. I wanna talk a little bit about some conservation efforts that can be done in the Chicago Living Corridor um, area and map. So let's let's begin tonight's talk in the Ecology and Conservation of Illinois Dragonflies. It's a little bit different talk than I have given in the past. It is more directed towards conservation. Uh, I have broken the webinar down into three segments. The first is the natural history of dragonflies. We are going to discuss their classification, their life cycle, and put their them into the larger ecological landscape to attempt conservation on a group of organisms without first understanding, at least in part, their natural history can be ill-advised. So we are going to um, first go through their background natural history. Then we'll look at Illinois species diversity and their distribution. I'm gonna pull up some maps and we will take a look at our very own species in our own backyard and then talk about conservation. Conservation in terms of state ranking of the Illinois species, how they are ranked, why they're ranked that, that way, what are the factors affecting their ranking and what we can do to help conserve uh, the, the rarer species in Illinois and what we should not do in order to help conserve them and promote their viability into the future. I have some references, resources for you and some suggestions for how you might get involved. Okay, let's begin first looking at natural history, the topic of classification. Just very quickly, how or what is a dragonfly? How do we classify it? First from a scientific standpoint and then just basically um, by, by looking at some of their traits. So in the taxonomic schematic for dragonflies, first and foremost, they are insects. They belong to the class Insecta. More to the point, more specifically, they are aquatic flying insects. And that sounds paradoxical, but actually two parts of their life cycle are spent in completely different habitats. If you look here, this is the adult. It lives for two to six weeks, very short-lived, and it is in our terrestrial habitat. It is generally the dragonfly stage that people notice. But in fact, the most important 
portion of a dragonfly's life cycle is spent under the water as a nymph. And that is also the longest period of their life cycle. So as aquatic insects, they are tied to wetlands and waterways, much more so than they are to their terrestrial habitats and, and the, the atmosphere. So we are going to spend a bit of time on nymphs tonight. Let's consider the order of insects that dragonflies belong to. They're called odonates because they belong to the insect order odonata. Odonata is actually Latin for toothed ones, which pretty much sums up dragonflies. They are voracious, aggressive carnivores in both their nymphal aquatic stage and their their adult terrestrial stage. They eat, they eat live prey. So they are massive predators in some habitats. They are the top predator. The odonates, as they are collectively referred to, can be broken down into two suborders, the zygoptera, which are the damselflies, and the anisoptera, which are the dragonflies. Through this presentation, I'm simply going to refer to them all as dragonflies, which most countries in the world do. In the United States, we like to make the distinction between these two suborders because damselflies are much smaller, they are weaker flyers, and they're about the size of toothpicks. Dragonflies, on the other hand, in the suborder Anisoptera, are robust. They are strong flyers. They are the dragonflies that birders usually are first introduced to because they, they are up in the atmosphere and they fly across their binocular field of view. And so a lot of birders get interested in dragonflies through just observing them in, in, while they're out twitching, so to speak. Okay, what makes a dragonfly a dragonfly. What's, what are the characteristics of odonates that make them so special? And basically, I can sum this up with three traits. First and foremost, their eyes. Dragonflies have a visual acuity that is basically unmatched in the animal kingdom. And that is not an exaggeration. This image right here it was take, was was stacked from 500 individual photos by a friend of mine, Steve Allen. He is retired from the Department of Agriculture in the state of Oregon, where he was an insect imaging specialist. And now he studies dragonfly eyes. And he studies dragonfly eyes through photography because their eyes are second to none. These compound eyes that you see here, each one encompasses almost the entire head capsule in a 360 degree global or spherical wrapped around manner, such that a dragonfly can see above, to the sides, beneath, and behind them. They, the eyes each have about 15,000 15, individual facets connected to neurons to the brain. They have the ability to see colors that you and I cannot even imagine. They have 15 photoreceptors. We have three for color. They can detect polarized light reflected out of wetlands and waterways. They can detect ultraviolet light. And they are primarily in both the nymphal and the adult stage, visual creatures relying heavily on vision. So here's a view. I'm just going to end the eyes here with the back of the head because nothing looks quite as crazy as the back of the head of a dragonfly or its thorax. The second trait that makes a dragonfly a dragonfly is their wings. In the flying insect realm, there are no other flying insects that have the maneuverability or the aeronautical skills 
that dragonflies have. In fact, I'm willing to argue that there's no other animal in the animal kingdom that can carry out the feats and the prowess of flight like dragonflies. And it comes down to the fact that each wing of the four wings on a dragonfly is connected individually to its own flight muscle. And so each of the four wings moves independently of the others, allowing them to move through the atmosphere, turn on a dime. Uh, they, can, they can drop off a perch, they can take off vertically, they can hover like a helicopter, they can fly up to 32 kilometers per hour, some species. They are phenomenal and they can carry heavy loads with those wings. So that's the second trait that puts them into this unique suborder. And finally, dare I say, odinate sex is also unrivaled in the animal kingdom. They copulate in a manner called the wheel position, which you see these two damselflies engaged in. The male is on top, the female is beneath and curling her abdomen around. Wheel, is actually a beautiful um, thing to observe. If you look at these dragonflies, the male is grasping the female behind the eyes. The female is curling her abdomen up and engaging his genitalia. The fact is that only dragonflies have two sets of genitalia in the male of the species one at the tip of their abdomen where they make the sperm and the other their penis at the base of their abdomen. And they transfer the sperm before they engage in, in copulation. And that is, this is the result. So a lot of times you see this enormous, what you think is an enormous insect flying through the air. It's actually just two dragonflies mating on the wing. So that's what makes an ode an ode. Let's take a look at our second topic in natural history, and that is the life cycle of dragonflies. Everybody learns about the complete metamorphosis of butterflies, from egg to the larval state called the caterpillar, to the pupal state called the chrysalis, to the adult flight. In dragonflies, they are considered hemimetabolous insects. They lay their eggs in water generally, or at least in emergent stems above the water. And that egg hatches into the aquatic stage known as the nymph. A nymph is not a larva. In fact, if you think about that cater caterpillar and pupa, the nymph of a dragonfly is almost a merging of those two stages of metamorphosis. So dragonfly nymphs eventually emerge into terrestrial winged adults, which are then lay the eggs. If we look at this life cycle in terms of the amount of time it takes to complete it, I'm just going to summarize average times for each. We can say that eggs generally after they are laid take about one to two weeks before they hatch. Now there are some eggs that are laid into plant material that overwinter as eggs, but for the most part they hatch in the water in a couple of weeks. They become the nymph and the nymph under the water remains for anywhere from two months to seven years in Illinois. That's the range for our Illinois species. So you can see that the nymph is the thing. This is what really is going to determine our discussion on conservation of dragonflies. We need to look under the water. The adults are not so tied to any given terrestrial or botanical habitat. Adults live somewhere between two to six weeks based on weather conditions and predation, just long enough to mate and lay the eggs again. It is in the nymphal stage where we need to consider the evolution of the species, the, the requirements of the habitat for maintaining the development of this immature state 
And we'll look at this life cycle in pictures in a moment. But I do want to say that nymphs, when they hatch from eggs, are very, very small, very diminutive. They, like a caterpillar, have to go through many molts. They generally go through about 13 molts before they get large enough and emerge as an adult. That emergence is called eclosion. And that is when they leave the water and they enter the land and the air. Okay, let's take a look at this. One of the things that I do is I rear dragonflies in my lab. Two years ago, I collected some eggs from a female dragon hunter. That's the name of this particular species because this particular species likes to hunt other dragons and eat other dragonflies. So we call it a dragon hunter. And this is the egg. It came out of the female fertilized, ready to develop. And then I simply photographed it as it moved through its developmental stages. And in two weeks time, you can see the nymph developing in the egg. This is the yolk sac here. And eventually it hatched. And what we have here is the, an early instar. It's called the second instar of the nymph. The length of this nymph from head to tail is about 1.5 millimeters. This is a very large nymph that hatched out of that egg, but it is still only one and a half millimeters long. As, as I said, it needs to go through about 13 molts before it gets large enough and is ready to emerge. Let's have a look at this process as though that that second instar grew, it shed its skin underwater, it did this repeatedly in various growth stages, and here are dragon hunter nymphs that I've removed from the water so that you can see some different sizes. This nymph here and this nymph here are the same age and developmental stage, they're early instars. This one's a little bit later. And then this one, this one, and this one are what we call final instars. You can actually see their wing pads have developed. And they are getting ready to eclose. At this late stage, when they reach that final instar, they generally stop eating for a week or so. And their wing pads swell, and they get ready to climb out of the water and be close. Let's have a look at dragon hunter nymphs and how they are so well adapted to their environment. This is an image right here you can see of a final instar dragon hunter nymph. In the waterways where I dip these and find them, they are very well adapted to large well oxygenated lakes along the edges where the waves hit and you get a lot of wash of detritus, leaf litter, bark, and so forth. And they are also found along rivers where they're at the edges of rivers where there is a, a, a piling up of this leaf litter. This particular species sprawls in that leaf litter. It hunts and it is extremely cryptic. It looks like this hawthorn leaf, which drops into its habitat in northern Wisconsin into the water. It hides well there and it allows it to be a good cryptic predator. Here's an example of how well adapted this dragon hunter nymph is to that particular aquatic habitat and its physical features. On this screen, this is a dip net I took from a, a river's edge. I pulled up a lot of bark and leaf litter. And there are actually three dragon hunter nymphs in this picture. You probably already found this one. Were you able to see this final instar nymph right here? Here's its, here's its hind leg, middle leg, foreleg. Here's its head. Well hidden. The third nymph is right in here. I can see its head and I can see its wing pads buried under some of that leaf litter. So my point here is that nymphs have evolved very specific morphological 
characteristics in order to survive and be successful in very specific physical characters of the waterways in which they grow and develop. And we'll see more on this later in the talk. So here's the final instar of the dragon hunter. This happens to be the largest nymph in North America. It's about the size of a quarter. And when it, it is ready to move out of the water, it climbs up stems onto rocks and it splits the skin over its thorax and it pulls itself out of that skin much like a cicada does, leaving behind the skin here and emerging as what we call a tenoral adult dragonfly. As you can see, this, this dragonfly that's just emerged, and it just takes minutes for it to emerge, it is still not a, a, a full fleshed out dragonfly. It takes a while for the insect blood called hemolymph to be pumped into all of these veins and stretch them out, to pump into the abdomen and stretch that out. Let's take a look when it has done that, what it looks like. Here we go. Now it is an aerial predator extraordinaire. It's in the terrestrial realm. And its sole goal now for the next month or so is to eat and mate. I want to just revisit that process of eclosion in a series of photographs because like dragonfly copulation, this is another wonder of the natural world. When dragonflies emerge, this is a different species that I reared in my lab. You can see that it's broken through that thorax. And if I go back to this slide here, you can actually see there's a line right here. This generally is split after the dragonfly crawls up out of the water and dries out a little bit, and they emerge from that line. There we go. And so this series of photographs just shows you those amazingly compact wings that were in those wing pads of the nymph and how they are filling with, with fluid, stretching out, and finally we have the phenomenal wings of a dragonfly. Those wings are so tightly packed in those wing pads of the nymph. It's like a, 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 a men's dress shirt. If you've ever purchased one of those and you take the pins out and you unfold it, there's no repackaging a dress shirt. There's no repackaging odinate wings. I put this picture in here to show you damselflies, the, the, the smaller, more diminutive relatives of the larger, more robust dragonflies. And I, I put this in here for a couple of reasons. First, to show you that damselflies also crawl out of the water and they eclose. They do so generally on emergent vegetation, which means that if you have a wetland or waterway on your private property, it is really important to maintain a, a border rich with vegetation and water that has native emergent vegetations. Damselflies especially need those emergents to crawl out of. This picture was taken at a pond that I monitored in King County for over six years. And during that amount of time, several things occurred in this incredible pond. It was the richest damselfly and a habitat I had ever found in Chicagoland. The, I could dip my net in and literally pull out three dozen damselfly nymphs at a time. I had never experienced that in the Chicago region. But unfortunately, two things happened. Uh, the rusty crayfish got into this pond. And if you know about the rusty crayfish, it is omnivorous as our crayfish, and it, it eats all of the aquatic vegetation into which damselflies insert their eggs and emerge. And it also ate all of the damselfly nymphs because they are so omnivorous. And over six years, I watched their populations crash, and I watched the emergent vegetation disappear from this pond until there were just a few dead stumps of leftover cattails upon which damselflies could emerge. 
And as you can see here, they that was their only purchase. They all crawled out on top of each other. You can see they are emerging on top of the spent skins of prior emergence and they were piling on top of each other, attempting to get out of the water. If dragonflies and damselflies do not get out of the water, or they are inundated by water while they are attempting to emerge, then they are unsuccessful because those delicate wings will not unfold properly when they are wet. Okay, so last topic of natural history is why should we care? The significance of dragonflies. What is the significance of dragonflies? Are they really that important in our biosphere? So I have three points I wanna make about their overall significance and why we should very much care. First of all, um, we have a, a model for evolution in dragonflies that many, many researchers use. They use dragonflies as a paradigm for evolution, evolutionary studies and research. The reason in part is that other than Ephemeroptera, the mayflies, there, I can't think of another insect on earth that has the ancient history of dragonflies. They are evolutionary success stories. So let's, take dragonflies and place them into context within the geologic time scale and see just how old these flying insects actually are. Insects evolved around the early Ordovician period, 480 million years ago. Flying insects showed up in the early Devonian, about 75 million years later. And by the Pennsylvanian epoch of the Carboniferous period of the latter portion of the Paleozoic, we saw, see griffin flies. And griffin flies are those dragonflies you always, dragonfly like creatures, excuse me, that you always see portrayed in those cycad forests of the, of the Carboniferous period as top predators, aerial predators, before there were even birds. They had two and a half foot wingspans. They're amazing. Here's a fossil from 300 million years ago. And you can see why people believed they were dragonflies. They look very, very similar to dragonflies. But in fact, they are not in the, in the line with modern day dragonflies. They were a sister group. And although they shared a common ancestors, modern dragonflies did not evolve from griffin flies. In fact, griffin flies went extinct. Here's another image that just kind of puts things into perspective because there are on this slide two extant North American species of dragonflies. They are some of the largest we have. They're called darners. And this image, which I took from the Harvard Museum of Natural History, it, it um, shows them in respect to a single wing fossil of a griffin fly. Not the whole wingspan, just one forewing. So it shows you how large those griffin flies were. And yes, they were impressive. But the bottom line is griffin flies did not um, make it through the, the extinction event I'm going to discuss. True dragonflies did. We see true dragonflies actually evolved around 270 million years ago. That's impressive that they are still around. There was the, 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 the major extinction event, the Triassopermian extinction. And in that extinction, what is it? Like the majority, 94%, 96% of, of all animal life on earth became extinct. It was the only major insect extinction event on earth and it took out about 70% of insects. Nothing like that has happened to insects until modern day. And so we, um, we can be fairly impressed that of the insects that made it through that extinction, true dragonflies did. And into the Mesozoic from the Triassic, Jurassic, and especially through the Cretaceous, they radiated out. They became our modern families. Fossils show us that, that our, the modern families we have now showed up at that time. Indeed, we used to say that the horseshoe crab was the oldest living species on earth. 
it has been hypothesis hypothesized and there's very good evidence that in fact the oldest living species unchanged for 103 million years is probably a dragonfly and it gets better because that particular dragonfly happens to fly in Illinois and it pretty much looks the same now as it did 100 million years ago so my point here is that over the course of 270 million years there have been so many environmental challenges thrown at dragonflies and they have met them and they've overcome them and i think that is a hopeful story for the future but let's talk about another reason why we should study and care about dragonflies and that is their role in the food web we said they're carnivores they're voracious carnivores and they're carnivores in the adult stage as you can see from the screen dragonfly adults are known to take out as many as 200 mosquitoes a day that should make us all want dragonflies in our backyard. In fact, when I do research up in Northern Wisconsin in the summertime, I love to have dragonflies fluttering around my head, taking out the deer fly that are trying to exsanguinate me. So dragonflies are great at taking out pest, um, flying pests like, like uh, mosquitoes in the adult stage. They take mosquitoes out in the nymph stage too. The nymphs love mosquito larvae. So you want them in your backyard pond. In terms of what they eat, they don't care. They're generalists. They will eat anything and it doesn't matter the size. It can be bigger than them. There are on record several incidences of dragonflies attacking hummingbirds. It's even one of them eating a hummingbird. So, so they can handle some pretty large game and they will eat each other. They're, they're cannibals. They are not picky at all. In the nymph stage, they play a major role in the aquatic, uh, the, the aquatic biomass and in the aquatic food web. And in certain habitats, such as ephemeral pools where there are no frogs, Dragonflies, nymphs, are the top predators. I was actually contacted by, I think they're called Windstar Films out of Britain in March or in February because they are doing an episode. I think they are the, the film company that filmed the Blue Planet or Planet Earth. They want to do a North American ecosystem documentary, and one of their episodes is to be filmed in the central plains of the United States they contacted me because they're interested in buffalo wallows old buffalo wallows depressions in that prairie the prairie pothole area that fill up with water and do not drain right away because although they don't have fish and they don't have frogs what they do have are dragonfly nymphs that are top predators in those buffalo wallows so they'll look for that in the future it'll be exciting to see if they actually get that that filmed um, but dragonfly nymphs are incredible predators. And this is a, a darner nymph that I reared in my lab. And I, I just want to uh, show you a little video of it. I had taken it from a very early instar stage. And as it went through its molts, I kept feeding it larger and larger aquatic invertebrate prey. But Darner nymphs will take snails out of their shell and rip them out. They will feed on minnows. They will feed on tadpoles as they get larger. And my particular nymph, here he is in his final instar, he was so hungry and he wasn't getting enough to eat. So I was really hard pressed to find food for him. I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna drop an earthworm in and see if he attacks it. They attack anything that moves because their sight, their vision, even in the nymphal stage, tells them it's moving, I'm going to eat it like a velociraptor. And so I just wanted to show you that they reach out, they have an amazing feeding mouth part that grabs this earthworm and I call this the croc and, and the boa because that's what it reminded me of. He would wrestle with those earthworms for a few minutes 
And then he would feed on it for a couple of days. And that's how I finally got him to his, his final stage. So they, they can handle some pretty big fare. Okay, um, the actually, you know what? Excuse me, I'm gonna go back here. The final thing that um, I wanted to mention on the food web is that although they are predators, they too are preyed upon. And I think it's important to understand that damselfly nymphs and dragonfly nymphs are major food source for waterfowl. For decades, dissections of the guts of migratory waterfowl has shown that they consist, the, the majority of their gut contents are dragonfly nymphs. So they, they do play an important role there. And of course, for herps, for things, things like frogs, they will eat the adult damselflies. So a, a pond filled with damselflies feeds a lot of frogs. It's interesting though, because people are always concerned about chemical pollutants in, in ponds and what effect it has on the invertebrate pop population. I cannot speak to that for other invertebrates, but damselfly and dragonfly nymphs seem to be more tied to the physical characteristics of the body of water rather than the chemical, other than some that are associated with certain acidity or alkalinity or salt content. But the, the dragonfly nymph is more about the temperature, the substrate, the, the flow, etc. the physical characters. However, um, when they have done studies on certain, certain chemical pollutants like Roundup, glyphosate, when that ends up in ponds, we all know that it disrupts the, the frog populations. And you see her populations crash when, when Roundup, uh, Roundup runs off into ponds. But by the same token, when those frog populations crash due to Roundup, the damselfly population skyrockets. So, so they actually do better with some of those chemical pollutants, not all, but some. So they, they do have a significant role in the aquatic and the, the terrestrial food web. Finally, the last bit of significance I wanted to cover tonight were the aquatic habitat indicators that they can be. And this primarily is the nymph stage. And so let's, let's just see how nymphs can indicate the type of an aquatic habitat, what type of wetland it is, what, what type of physical features that waterway has can be indicated by the nymph assemblage of dragonflies that you find in it. On the screen is a composite picture of the 10 families of dragonflies and nymphs that we have in Illinois. This is something that I, I um, produced and, and published recently showing the habitus or body types of the 10 different families. And you can see how very different those nymphs look. The nymphs, as I mentioned earlier, have adapted through not millennia, but hundreds of thousands, millions of years to very specific physical parameters in the, the, the waterway. And you can see that morphologically, they have different characteristics and those body types help us discern what type of substrate, for example, they are in. The one in the middle here is a sprawler and like sand and gravel, and you can see the mottled appearance of its body. It, it, it's extremely cryptic. Its legs are very, very long. The one on top here, um, let me get my pen. This one right here has four legs that are very short and it digs and digs and digs into mud and burrows. This, this one, it is uh, called thigmotactic. It clings to stems and it and it hangs on to um, to subaquatic vegetation, and that's how it hunts. So they each have different body features. These are just representative species of those ten families that we'll we'll discuss um, in a second. I want to first look at this map of Illinois that outlines some basic ecoregions. 
it's courtesy of the Illinois Natural History Survey. And if we look up in the Northeast here, in the Northeast Morainal area, there are a, a, a number of wetlands that we don't see anywhere else in the, in the state. And especially when you look at, um, at Lake and McHenry County, they contain some phenomenal wetlands called fens. And two of these fens, Bluff Spring Fen and Lake and Hill uh, Fen, let's see, Bluff Spring is actually down in suburban Cook County, but Lake and the Hills Fen is in my county, McHenry County, and they have groundwater seeps through limestone into very shallow, flat, flattened um, fens with short vegetation. And there happens to be a species of dragonfly called the elfin skimmer, whose nymph is very, very well adapted to that cold groundwater, and it cannot exist anywhere else in the state. It primarily inhabits bogs in the north, but it comes into McHenry and Cook County at just those two locations. It is a bee or wasp mimic, as you can see there. It is also the smallest dragonfly we have in North America and the second smallest dragonfly in the world. It's about the size of a bumblebee. And so it is present in our state specifically because the nymph can grow and develop in, um, in that specific fen habitat. Here's another example of nymphs that are so niched into specific wetlands. This is the gray petal tail. This is, in fact, that species I talked about that is guessed to be 103 million years old, basically unchanged. It's one of two extant species of petal tails in the, in the United States, and it comes into the eastern central, uh, or central eastern region of Illinois because right here in the Wabash River area, there are some high bluffs and the, those high bluffs drain into a couple of really nice sphagnum seeps. So there's two or three areas where the nymph of the gray petal tail right in here, uh, right in here in this brown area can develop. Petal tail nymphs develop not in the water but above the water in seepage flow under sphagnum and, uh, and fallen leaves. And they are so unique. That seep, the fen up here in, in northern Illinois, those hydrologies are under threat from development. And those are very niched and small pocket rooms areas in the state. And the last thing I was going to mention here on this, this image, just to give you an idea of the adaptations of nymphs for very specific physical characters of waterways. This is the eastern ringtail. And you never see it in large populations anywhere in the state. When you do see it, you see it in the, in the central, and, and it comes into some of the, the lower counties of, of the Chicagoland area, but you only see one or two individuals at the most. And in all the years I've dip netted the wetlands and river systems throughout the state of Illinois, I've never found a nymph of the species until last month. At the very beginning of the month, I was dip netting the Maison River in central Illinois, and I was dip netting a very specific sandy um, drift of old glacial till, and I finally found the eastern ringtail nymph in that area, I found one, and I was absolutely thrilled because to understand the nymphal habitat is to understand exactly what we need to protect. Some dragonflies have adapted phenomenally well to temporary pools of water. This is one, it's called the wandering glider. And the wandering glider is well named. It wanders all over the, all over the world. It is found on six of the seven continents, Antarctica being the exception. It is now believed to be a single population 
genetically. Because this dragonfly moves hundreds of miles out away from shore over the oceans, it will land on ships that are hundred miles, hundreds of miles away from land. And every chance it gets to oviposit, deposit its eggs in shallow little pools water takes. I have caught it depositing eggs on my car hood because it's shiny after I've waxed it. They attempt to deposit their eggs in swimming pools in backyards. They are all about, their nymphs are all about being reared in five weeks. They go through 13 molts in five to six weeks. So if a truck tire leaves a deep tread recess and it rains and it fills up and that water stays for five weeks and it fills with mosquito larvae, the nymph of the wandering glider can make it all the way from egg to eclosion into an adult. It is a phenomenally successful strategist. And I have never found one of its nymphs. The nymphs I've had and I've photographed have been sent to me by um, an entomology friend. And so this is a, a very, very successful dragonfly because it, um, it can make use of temporary waterways. All right, so our next topic is diversity. Let's simply get a look overall worldwide at how many ornate species there are. It's about 6,000. They fall into 44 different families. When we look at the United States and Canada, that portion of North America, the number of families goes down to about 12 and about 462 species, give or take one or two. That was the last tally. In Illinois, we cut out two of those families and we have about 142 species of dragons and damsels. And in Chicagoland, in the Chicago Living Corridors area, we're down to about nine families, 107 species. If we look at this map, we can see that the states in the United States that have the majority of species lie to the right of the line I just drew. They're in the forested zones where we have a great diversity of aquatic habitats. We have a lot of rain and a lot of aquatic habitats. And dragonflies can be found in virtually every freshwater habitat on the planet Earth and some brackish water habitats. When we look to the left of that line in the Pacific Northwest, there are many fewer species of dragonflies, but they are very different species. So quite unique and adapted to those Pacific Northwest wetlands. Illinois right here, it has a decent number of dragonfly species. Only a few that I am aware of through um, the historical records that we do have going back to the mid 1800s have become extirpated in Illinois. So uh, that's actually good news. We, we still have records and, and extant or current records of, of the majority of species that ever were in Illinois. Okay, so let's just quickly, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Let's take a quick look at the 10 different families of dragonflies that we have in Illinois, the nine in the Chicagoland region. They fall into some, um, some neat categories, neat names. Broadwing damselflies are ruby spots and jewel wings. They tend to be in flowing or lotic waterways, riverine species. We have the spread wings, the spread wings so named for obvious reasons. These are damselflies that prefer ephemeral pools, vernal pools that dry up by, by mid to late summer. They lay their eggs in the, the stems of the emergence in those pools and the snowpack in the wintertime protects those eggs. So they overwinter in, as eggs. And then when it melts, and it forms the pool again, the egg hatches, falls out of the stem into the water and completes development. Pond damsels, this is one of our larger families of dragonflies. It, um, it includes wonderful examples, or wonderful gene genera, like the dancers and the bluets. Not all bluets are blue, here's an orange one. Um, the the fork tails, you can see the, the barb here at the end of its, its abdomen. 
and red damsels. This is a species complex that has not been well uh, differentiated. We're not exactly sure which species or whether we have a hybrid species in Illinois. Uh, the sprites, sprites are some of our smallest damselflies. They are on the order of a straight pin in length and um, their abdomens are, are sometimes thinner than a straight pin, so they're very, very small. They love um, marshes and wetlands. With the dragonflies, the darners are so noticeable because they're huge and they fly uh, great distances. Some of them are migratory and, and can fly a thousand miles. The petal tails we've discussed, the club tails are a favorite family of my mine, and for a lot of entomologists, they love club, club tails because, gosh, just having that, that club at the end of the abdomen is striking. This is the cobra club tail. We have this in some wonderful um, areas in Northern Illinois where we have large rivers that are, are in good, good shape or protected edges. This is a flag-tailed uh, spiny legs, which is a club tail. I put this picture on here just because I love this species. It's got very long hind legs with, with great spines coming off of it. This is found in a few areas in Northern Illinois, and I found it to a greater extent in Central and East Central Illinois, but I've never found the nymph in Illinois, and I would love to know where those nymphs are growing and developing so that we can protect it. The, um, the spike tail family, we have just one spike tail left in Illinois. There are some historical records, uh, to any great extent, there are some historical records of other spike tails. Um, I don't know whether two of those species are still present. I'm searching for them in Illinois. These, these are early spring species that come out for four weeks or so, six, uh, six at the most. They're called spike tails because you can see down in this abdomen, the females, these are both females, they have a very long ovipositor. And spike tails, like fishless streams, like you get at Deer Grove Forest Preserve or down in the Palos area where you get streams running through those um, those those canyons and, and, and bluffs of the Oak Hickory forests that are fishless and the females drive, they just pile drive their eggs into the mud on the side of those banks and the nymphs develop there. The family of cruisers are well named. Males will cruise up to an eighth of a mile along a river system, non-stop back and forth looking for a female all day. They almost never sit down. The emeralds are a wonderful northern group of, of our family of dragonflies. We find them in Canada all the way up to the Arctic. We have a couple of emeralds in Illinois. They are named because they generally have some iridescent or metallic green on their bodies and their eyes are generally emerald. The skimmers is a, is a very, very large family. And this is probably the family of which you know the most dragonfly species. This is a calico pennant. A lot of skimmers are perchers, so you see them better. And they're also primarily of, of still water habitats. So these are the ones you see around ponds. They have a, uh, they oftentimes have pigment on their wings, so they are more visible. And they, they come in many different varieties, including the saddlebags, as you can see the pigment at the base of its wings. When we look overall at these 10 families and the distribution of species amongst them, you can see that in fact, the pond damsels and the skimmers take the cake. They are primarily still water species of dragonflies. And the club tails do pretty well. They're mostly riverine. If I look at the distribution in Illinois here of these species, this graph looks very much the same as what you would find for all of the United States. So it alone is not an indicator of any kind of conservation need. It's an indicator of the fact that these three families have radiated out in North America very, very well. But let's talk now about conservation. And to do this, we need to consider state ranking, conservation status as determined by the state of Illinois. Dr. Timothy Kishat reviews the dragonfly 
species status in Illinois every five or so years. In fact, he just completed it. We worked together on it in October. And so it is currently updated and he uses the state ranking system. And I would like to just very briefly show you this. The state ranking system goes uh, uses numbers one through five to denote the rarity of a species. S1 being a species that is critically imperiled in our state because of extreme rarity, S5 being demonstrably secure. In other words, basically, if you are listed as an S5 dragonfly in Illinois, you are considered uneradicable. And there's some, some pros and some cons to being uneradicable. And then S2, 3, and 4, those are various gradations in between. Basically, an S1 or S2 status is something to be concerned about for, um, for a state species. We have some other acronyms here, state listed endangered, state listed threatened, federally listed endangered and threatened, and the watch list. We want to keep an eye out for it if it's on the, the watch list because we are concerned. So um, let's, let's just take a, a, a look here. Let's see if I can get back at um, the distribution in Illinois of our species by rank. So I've made a graph that I want to take a look at here. And this is a more significant graph for our state species than the last one. As you can see, I, there, there are a number of rankings over here that I want you to ignore. Those are state accidental or historical records that have been extirpated or inappropriately or wrongfully reported species. So we're going to ignore those. And we're going to take a look here, the S3 through S5, these are pretty secure in the state. Those are good ranks and we're not worried about them in terms of their, their prolonged viability. So that part's not shocking. Down here, if we look at the S1s and S2s, what we do find that is shocking is there are 45 species in the state of Illinois that are ranked as imperiled or critically imperiled. Now, let's take a quick look at, um, at, at these these ranking systems and what they may or may not mean before we consider some of these rarer finds in the state. First of all, um, what when we talk about being an S5 dragonfly, that isn't always a good sign of habitat health. And here's why. I have what I call the suburban eight. The dragonflies you're seeing on the screen, the eastern forktail, the green darner that everybody seems to know, the eastern pond hawk, the black saddlebags, the beautiful 12 spotted skimmer, the ever present common whitetail, the widow skimmer and finally the blue dasher. These are beautiful dragonflies, no doubt. They are everywhere and they're everywhere and they're S5 because their nymphs can take just about anything. Their nymphs are weedy. They show up in drainage ditches. They show up as the first colonizers of retention ponds in, in, in townhome developments and apartment complexes. When a developer says, I'm going to um, drain this wetland to build, but then I will reestablish a wetland. They have removed the native dragonfly and damselfly species from the wetland they drained, and they have introduced in no time flat these um, suburban eight. So these are colonizers of of uh, human disturbance. And these are the ones that most people are familiar with simply because their nymphs don't require much. At the other end of the scale, we have a critically imperiled Heinz emerald dragonfly here 
on the screen, which is the only federally listed endangered species in the lower 48. There are a handful of federally listed endangered species of dragonflies in the Hawaiian Islands. Other than that, this is it. Because insects are pretty much disregarded by the, the endangered species legislation. Very few insects are listed. Dr. Kashat actually got the Heinz Emerald listed in 1996. When you look at the map that I've put up here, this map is from Odonata Central, an online database that I will talk about later. But we're going to look at some of these maps. And as we do, I want you to notice that anywhere you see an orange box, that is a region where historically we know from old records that are 50 years old or older, that that species was present. Anywhere you see green or blue, it means it's present now. So when we look at this endemic species of the Midwest, we see that there is actually only a few regions left in the world of this dragonfly. An area where it is present is in the Chicago Living Corridor map. And so um, I, I, I participated, I worked on um, a, a Section 6 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grant. I was a, uh, the PI on that for a year, and I located a couple of small additional populations in the Chicago region. And since then, they have found out here in um, Winnebago County, they found another population. So we do need to do the surveys and do adequate surveys before we list a species. But the point is those, those areas that were found are about the size of a bedroom. They're very, very small because this species nymphs must have a very specific sheet flow of groundwater over limestone bedrock that is of a specific type called dolomite. And that hydrology together with the fact that the nymphs have a symbiotic relationship with the devil crayfish and go down into the burrows of the devil crayfish below the water line in the winter time to overwinter are the aspects of its habitat that must be maintained to maintain the species. It is critically imperiled that it's genetically bottlenecked up in Wisconsin, up here. And although that population is very large, the genetic diversity in the Chicago region is the highest remaining. So they are working on trying to restore habitat and have been unsuccessful with restoring habitat. You can't restore that kind of hydrology. It's disappearing because we are digging wells for municipalities. We are tiling and draining um, areas and putting up strip malls, although that may go away here now the, um, in the future. But it's, its habitat has been destroyed because we have rerouted water. So that's at the other extreme. Marla, we need to look at, think about the time. Okay, so uh, thank you. And here we go. Uh, I am just quickly then going to uh, talk about the factors affecting rank because rank doesn't necessarily mean conservation efforts are needed, even if it is ranked as an S2. When we look at many species, the, they are simply ranked as, as, as rare in, in Illinois because they are primarily Northern species like you see on this map. And so the River Jewel Wing, we have five, six locations in Illinois, but it doesn't come south. They were, we're right at the edge of its map. I, I will, um, let's see, rather than go back, we'll just talk about some other factors here. Other factors for, that affect ranking, some of them are on the move for climate change or their colonizers. The Springwater Dancer, you can see in Chicagoland right here, it, it, it has colonized in the last uh, decade. I don't know why. It is primarily a southwestern species, and it is moving into Chicagoland due to human human disturbance or just it's an attempted strategy. It, its habitat in Chicagoland is completely different than it is in the desert southwest. So, um, so again, the ranking of the species 
it, it may be an S5 in another five years. We can look at the rusty snake tail. This, this has a historical records in Illinois. And I found it down here in East Central Illinois after 100 years at the exact same spot it was recorded 100 years ago. Since then, it's been found up in, in Winnebago County. But the problem here isn't to me that the rusty snake tail deserves a critically imperiled status. It's simply the behavior of, this, of, of snake tails. You may see one and there's a thousand roosting up in the trees. They come to the water, they come to rocks in the middle of the, the river or, and, and they sit down in there at a certain time of day when the shade and the sun are right. And if you're not out in the river, you're not going to see them or count them. So it's inadequate surveying because once I started dip netting, I started finding their nymphs in rivers all throughout um, uh, Northern Illinois and, and, and Central Illinois. Spatter Doc Darner has a scarcity of habitat that may have nothing to do with humans. It relies on spatter dock being present in a fishless pond. This species, the gilded river cruiser, it look at its distribution. It is so spotty, yet it flew into the prairie, uh, the, the cornfields beside the prairie that my husband and I are restoring right here. This is Livingston County and that is boxed out because I took this picture of the Gilded River Cruiser on our, our um, right at the edge of our prairie. It's posed on a corn stalk. And it's not posed, I'm sorry, it's set down on a corn stalk. I have no idea where this came from. The, an entomologist, it is so rare, it's one of the rare species. We don't know its nipple habitat. And that's a problem because we need to conserve it. Um, this, this may or may not be. Uh, a Gilded River Cruiser nymph because its nymph hasn't been differentiated well. So we are in the process of trying to seek that out. Okay, and Dusky Dancer, this has come in and hijacked in fisheries. It was found up in Ottawa, Illinois in the fishery there. It obviously came in on, on fish. So hijacking and boat trafficking and so forth can, can be an issue. The Dusky Clubtail was once very common in northeastern Illinois. It was last recorded in the 1800s and not found again for over 100 years until about 2009. What happened? Why did it disappear? It had to do with humans and drainage and so forth, but when I find the nymphs now, and I find them quite often, they are in old borrow pits and, and um, reclaimed quarries. So it disappeared during development and when those successional events occurred again in the waterways of old quarries, it has recolonized and find it in, in, in quarries or borrow pits that are 30 years old. So I know it's moving back in to the area. The comment Darner, this Marla, one is- a, yeah. I am sorry to interrupt, but we have people leaving because our time is up. So we need okay. to- be able to close okay. and give them some information. So let, me, let me just wrap this up for strategies for conservation then. What can you do on your private land? Leave the ponds and shorelines well vegetated. Don't mow up to the edges and plant native aquatics. Maintain no wake zones. Don't let boats create waves that would destroy uh, synchronous emergence um, and, and make sure the shorelines are undisturbed. Don't stock ponds with fish if you can help it. A lot of dragonfly nymphs um, do not do well with, what is it, centrarchid fish, the black bass and sunfish. Don't channel streams, try and stabilize banks. They don't do good with flash where you scour the mud where they, the nymphs burrow. Remove tiles and, and try not to drain lowlands and uh, don't allow road salt. If you wanna get involved, these are the organizations. Dragonfly Society of the Americas, Wisconsin Dragonfly Society, they both have annual meetings. Go to them. Dragonfly people love to go out in the field. The meetings are all spent pretty much in the field learning and studying dragonflies. Friends of Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge in the Chicago Living Quarters and up into Wisconsin is our newest national wildlife. They are trying to establish wetland corridors do backyard surveys. You can upload your sightings to Odinata Central. And finally, here are a few resources, including a free download, My Damselfly Guide. If you go um, to Damselflies of Chicago Land on the Field Museum website, they have published it, and it is a free download reference for, the, yeah, for damsels, Dragonflies of Damselflies of the East by Dennis Paulson. Dragonfly ID app for your phone is a free download. And then field supplies, you can go to BioQuip to get what you need 
And that is it. I'd just like to wish you all the warmest um, winter <laughs> without climate change until spring breaks through. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, we just need to move on to uh, some closing slides and then we'll have time for a few questions at the end if, if uh, folks can stay around. If you need to leave, we understand that. Um, Iris, can you give me the forwarding with the slides? Here we go. I wanted to let you know that we are uh, have recorded this program. It's going to be available after a few days on the chicagolivingcorridors.org website under uh, resources. And uh, because it was so much good information, you may want to just review some of it. I uh, hope you weren't trying to keep take notes all the way through. <laughs> but in general, we recommend exactly what Marla just did uh, about uh, uh, planting natives and uh, taking care of your property in a way that you're paying attention to the needs of the insects and other critters. Uh, tell other people about these, uh, uh, the website and these webinars. We have another one coming up next month. Uh, we have a Facebook page uh, or join one of the participating organizations that we showed you. In January, on January 14th, we are going to have a program on native shrubs in the home landscape. Uh, and that is now going to be um, uh, hosted by the Barrington Area Library. So if you've signed up for the program for today, you will get an email. It'll be a different kind of a registration than you had for today, but, but it'll work pretty much the same way. It's a webinar. It's a Thursday night instead of Wednesdays, and it's going to be starting at 7 as these have been doing. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll leave this up while, uh, uh, if, if, Iris, do you have a couple questions we can, we can take? And Marla, can you stay for a couple more minutes? Absolutely. I apologize for going over. Yep, no problem. Um, also, I just want to note that I dropped the registration link for next month's webinar in the chat box. Uh, so you can access it there. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions, Marla, so I know we won't be able to get through all of them uh, today. So we will um, circle up with you afterwards um, and maybe follow up on some questions uh, that we're not able to answer. A um, couple of questions that I thought might be good to flag. Um, do you have any specific recommendations for aquatic plants and terrestrial plants uh, to plant? Yeah. There, there are there are some rushes uh, that that certain dragonflies like to oviposit in, and let's see, scurpus I think is the genus of of some arrow arrowhead. I'm not a botanical person, but arrowhead and scurpus lily pads are wonderful uh, to to put in. I would say uh, cattails are great. I know how invasive cattails can be, so if you can control those. But cattails, scurpus, and short spike rush, I believe it's called, is, is very short. Some damselflies may use that uh, and, and at least for perches to emerge. But, but if you have any kind of reed or rush that is native, along with arrowhead and lily pads. That is what I would recommend. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another very specific question was, are there any preserves in particular where you might find the gray petal tail? Uh, someone was commenting that the type of habitat you described for it sounds incredible. Yes, um, there is a, and and let me, let me look this up very quickly, but it's, there is a, preserve. It is a state park, and I cannot remember the name of it. I camped there this summer, and the name ex escapes me, but Bob Woodward, or Babe, no, 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 uh, not Babe Woodward. Hold on just one second, and I will, I will find it. It's actually on Odonata Central, and if you go to odonatacentral.org, you can put in the um, the gray petal tail, and you can locate exactly where it's been seen. And I'm going to do that right now, and tell you the name of the preserve. It is south 
of, let's see, it's south of Champaign, over south of, just south of Danville, Illinois, in Vermilion County. And let's see if I can find the exact site. Is there any other question? Uh, okay. Sure. Well, while you are um, looking that up, another comment was um, that you noted or mentioned, sorry, that uh, lakes and rivers, um, as well as vernal pools and potholes are all places where you might find nymphs. Uh, yes. The question is, just to be clear, uh, will any body of water, uh, can that provide a home for dragonfly nymphs so long as the water is retained for long enough? Uh, I would say there, yes, that that is true. There are very few, there's probably some very saline um, bodies of water out in the desert southwest that do not house nymphs. But for the most part, if the water um, does not evaporate too soon, they, they certain species that are adapted to rapid growth can can survive in it. So you even find them in the water tanks of like across Nebraska and Kansas where all those livestock are are kept and they've got those metal water tanks out in the middle of that, that vast plain. You will find if the water is kept in there, you'll find dragonfly nymphs at the bottom. So I would say that is true. And certainly in backyard ponds, as long as you maintain some substrate at the bottom, not just a naked liner, so they need a little bit, some nymphs are burrowers, some are climbers, some are sprawlers. If they're burrowers, they need a little bit of soft mud or sand and silt, depending on, on the species. So those are nymphs that do not require flowing water that would, and, and they don't need a lot of oxygen. The riverine species, they need that oxygen. Okay. So I found the, 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 the forest preserve, it's called Forest Glen. Forest Preserve in Vermilion County, Forest Glen. And there are some very small, but very beautiful seeps in that area. Okay, thank you. Um, the rest of the questions I would say are pretty specific. Uh, so Marla, we'll circle back with you on those um, so you can respond to them. Uh, okay. We also have on the slide on the screen, uh, Marla's contact information, her email address, um, and she indicated that she'd happily take questions that you have, um, so you can reach out to her as well. Um, Absolutely. You guys, that's my work email. Just send an email with any question you have, or if you have any um, any wetland on your property that, that you are yourself um, looking at dragonflies for and you need any IDs go ahead and um, use that email if you wish for some some help or assistance with identification. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, two final points. Um, wanted to uh, mention that we have recorded today's webinar um, and we will again be posting um, a recording. I think Peggy might have mentioned that already, but just another reminder. Um, and then also there will be a survey uh, so once the webinar ends, I uh, should have a survey screen pop up and we'd appreciate your feedback um, on that survey. So with that, uh, Peggy or Marla, any last comments? Just want to thank Marla tremendously for this wonderful program and thank you so much for uh, helping educate us about <laughs> what we one area that we need to add to our habitat restoration. Thank you. My, my pleasure. And I just wanted to add that I really appreciate the purpose of Chicago Living Corridors and that I think for the future private landowners, um, they can make all of the difference. It's the only way that, that we, can, we can do what we need to do to help, um, re help animal life and plant life. So thank you all for, for coming tonight and I really appreciate your attendance.